Let Loose by Mary Chamundali Read for you by Chiquito Crasto Let Loose The dead abide with us, though stark and cold. Earth seems to grip them. They are with us still. Some years ago I took up architecture and made a tour through Holland, studying the buildings of that interesting country. I was not then aware that it is not enough to take up art. Art must take you up too. I never doubted but that my passing enthusiasm for her would be returned. When I discovered that she was a stern mistress, who did not immediately respond to my attention, I naturally transferred them to another shrine. There are other things in the world besides art. I am now a landscape gardener. But at the time of which I write, I was engaged in a violent flirtation with architecture. I had one companion on this expedition, who has since become one of the leading architects of the day. He was a thin, determined-looking man, with a screwed-up face and heavy jaw, slow of speech, and absorbed in his work to a degree which I quickly found tiresome. He was possessed of a certain quiet power of overcoming obstacles which I have rarely seen equalled. He has since become my brother-in-law, so I ought to know. For my parents did not like him much and opposed the marriage, and my sister did not like him at all, and refused him over and over again. But nevertheless, he eventually married her. I have thought since that one of his reasons for choosing me as his travelling companion on this occasion was because he was getting up steam for what he subsequently termed an alliance with my family. But the idea never entered my head at the time. A more careless man as to dress I have rarely met, and yet in all the heat of July in Holland, I noticed that he never appeared without a high starched collar, which had not even fashion to commend it at that time. I often chaffed him about his splendid collars, and asked him why he wore them, but without eliciting any response. One evening, as we were walking back to our lodgings in Middleburg, I attacked him for about the thirtieth time on the subject. "'Why on earth do you wear them?' I said. "'You have, I believe, asked me that question many times,' he replied, in his slow, precise utterance, but always on occasions when I was occupied. "'I am now at leisure, and I will tell you.' And he did. I have put down what he said, as nearly in his own words as I can remember them. Ten years ago, I was asked to read a paper on English frescoes at the Institute of British Architects. I was determined to make the paper as good as I could, down to the slightest details, and I consulted many books on the subject, and studied every fresco I could find. My father, who had been an architect, had left me at his death all his papers and notebooks on the subject of architecture. I searched them diligently and found in one of them a slight unfinished sketch of nearly fifty years ago that specially interested me. Underneath was noted in his clear and small hand, frescoed east wall of crypt, parish church, wet wasteland on the walls, Yorkshire, via Pickering. The sketch had such a fascination for me that I decided to go there and see the fresco for myself. I had only a very vague idea as to where West Waste on the Walls was, but I was ambitious for the success of my paper. It was hot in London, and I set off on my long journey, not without a certain degree of pleasure, with my dog Brian, a large nondescript brindled creature as my only companion. I reached Pickering in Yorkshire in the course of the afternoon and then began a series of experiments on local lines which ended, after several hours, in my finding myself deposited a little out-of-the-world station within nine or ten miles of wet waste. As no conveyance of any kind was to be had, I shouldered my portmanteau, and set out on a long white road that stretched away into the distance over the bare treeless wold. I must have walked for several hours, over a waste of moorland patched with heather, when a doctor passed me, 
and gave me a lift to within a mile of my destination. The mile was a long one, and it was quite dark by the time I saw the feeble glimmer of lights in front of me, and found that I had reached wet waste. I had considerable difficulty in getting anyone to take me in, but at last I persuaded the owner of the public house to give me a bed, and, quite tired out, I got into it as soon as possible for fear he should change his mind, and fell asleep to the sound of a little stream below my window. I was up early next morning, and inquired directly after breakfast the way to the clergyman's house, which I found was close at hand. At wet waste everything was close at hand. The whole village seemed composed of a straggling row of one-storied grey stone houses, the same colour as the stone walls that separated the few fields enclosed from the surrounding waste, and as the little bridges over the beck that ran down one side of the grey-white street. Everything was grey. The church, the low tower of which I could see at a little distance, seemed to have been built of the same stone. So was the parsonage when I came up to it accompanied on my way by a mob of rough, uncouth children, who eyed me and Brian with half-defined curiosity. The clergyman was at home, and after a short delay I was admitted. Leaving Brian in charge of my drawing materials, I followed the servant into a low-panelled room in which, at a latticed window, a very old man was sitting. The morning light fell on his white head bent low over a litter of papers and books. Mr. Uh, he said, looking up slowly, with one finger keeping his place in a book. Blake! Blake! he repeated after me, and was silent. I told him that I was an architect, that I had come to study a fresco in the crypt of his church, and asked for the keys. The crypt, he said, pushing up his spectacles and peering hard at me. The crypt has been closed for thirty years, ever since— and he stopped short. I should be much obliged for the keys, I said again. He shook his head. No, he said, no one goes in there now. It is a pity, I remarked, for I have come a long way with that one object. And I told him about the paper I had been asked to read and the trouble I was taking with it. He became interested. Ah, he said, laying down his pen and removing his finger from the page before him. I can understand that. I also was young once, and fired with ambition. The lines have fallen to me in somewhat lonely places, and for forty years I have held the cure of souls in this place, where truly I have seen but little of the world, though I myself may not be unknown in the paths of literature. Possibly you may have read a pamphlet written by myself on the Syrian version of the three authentic epistles of Ignatius. Sir, I said, I am ashamed to confess that I have not time to read even the most celebrated books. My one object in life is my art, ars longa vita brevis, you know. You are right, my son, said the old man, evidently disappointed, but looking at me kindly. There are diversities of gifts, and if the Lord has entrusted you with a talent, look to it. Lay it not up in a napkin. I said I would not do so if he would lend me the keys of the crypt. He seemed startled by my recurrence to the subject and looked undecided. Why not? he murmured to himself. The youth appears a good youth, and superstition? What is it but distrust in God? He got up slowly, and taking up a large bunch of keys out of his pocket, opened with one of them an oak cupboard in the corner of the room. They should be here, he muttered, peering in, but the dust of many years deceives the eye. See, my son, if among these parchments there be two keys, one of iron and very large, and the other steel and of a long, thin appearance. I went eagerly to help him, and presently found in the back drawer two keys tied together, which he recognized at once. Those are they, he said. The long one opens the front door at the bottom of the steps which go down against the outside wall of the church hard by the sword graven in the wall. The second opens but it is hard of opening and of shutting, the iron door within the passage leading to the crypt itself. My son, is it necessary to your treatise that you should enter the script? I replied that it was absolutely necessary. Then take them, he said, and in the evening you will bring them to me again. I said I might want to go several days running, 
and asked if he would not allow me to keep them till I had finished my work, but on that point he was firm. Likewise, he added, be careful that you lock the first door at the foot of the steps before you unlock the second, and lock the second also while you are within. Furthermore, when you come out, lock the iron inner door as well as the wooden one. I promised I would do so, and after thanking him, hurried away, delighted at my success in obtaining the keys. Finding Brian and my sketching materials waiting for me in the porch, I eluded the vigilance of my escort of children by taking the narrow path between the parsonage and the church, which was close at hand, standing in a quadrangle of ancient years. The church itself was interesting, and I noticed that it must have arisen out of the ruins of a previous building, judging from the number of fragments of stone caps and arches bearing traces of very early carving now built into the walls. There were incised crosses too in some places, and one especially caught my attention, being flanked by a large sword. It was in trying to get a nearer look at this that I stumbled, and looking down saw at my feet a flight of narrow stone steps green with moss and mildew. Evidently, this was the entrance to the crypt. I at once descended the steps, taking care of my footing, for they were damp and slippery in the extreme. Brian accompanied me as nothing would induce him to remain behind. By the time I had reached the bottom of the stairs, I found myself almost in darkness, and I had to strike a light before I could find the keyhole and the proper key to fit into it. The door, which was of wood, opened inwards fairly easily, although an accumulation of mould and rubbish in the ground outside showed it had not been used for many years. Having got through it, which was not altogether an easy matter as nothing would induce it to open more than about eighteen inches, I carefully locked it behind me, although I should have preferred to leave it open, as there is to some minds an unpleasant feeling in being locked in anywhere, in case of a sudden exit seeming advisable. I kept my candle alight with some difficulty, and after groping my way down a low and, of course, exceedingly dark passage, came to another door. A toad was squatting against it, who looked as if he had been sitting there about a hundred years. As I lowered the candle to the floor, he gazed at the light with unblinking eyes, and then retreated slowly into a crevice in the wall, leaving against the door a small cavity in the dry mud which had gradually silted up round his person. I noticed that this door was of iron, and had a long bolt, which, however, was broken. Without delay, I fitted the second key into the lock, and pushing the door open after considerable difficulty, I felt the cold breath of the crypt upon my face. I must own I experienced a momentary regret at locking the second door again as soon as I was well inside, but I felt it my duty to do so. Then, leaving the key in the lock, I seized my candle and looked round. I was standing in a low vaulted chamber with groined roof cut out of the solid rock. It was difficult to see where the crypt ended as further light thrown on any point only showed other rough archways or openings cut in the rock which had probably served at one time for family vaults. A peculiarity of the wet waste crypt which I had not noticed in other places of that description was the tasteful arrangement of skulls and bones which were packed about four feet high on either side. The skulls were symmetrically built up to within a few inches of the top of the low archway on my left, and the shin bones were arranged in the same manner on my right. But the fresco, I looked round for it in vain. Perceiving at the further end of the crypt a very low and very massive archway, the entrance to which was not filled up with bones, I passed under it and found myself in a second smaller chamber. Holding my candle above my head, the first object its light fell upon was the fresco, and at a glance I saw that it was unique. Setting down some of my things with a trembling hand on a rough stone shelf hard by, which had evidently been a credence table, I examined the work more closely. It was a reredos over what had probably been the altar at the time the priests were proscribed. The fresco belonged to the earliest part of the 15th century and was so perfectly preserved that I could almost trace the limits of each day's work in the plaster, as the artist had dashed it on and smoothed it out with his trowel. The subject was the ascension, gloriously treated. I can hardly describe my elation as I stood and looked at it, and reflected that this magnificent specimen of English fresco painting 
would be made known to the world by myself. Recollecting myself at last, I opened my sketching bag, and lighting all the candles I had brought with me, set to work. Brian walked about near me, and though I was not otherwise than glad of his company in my rather lonely position, I wished several times I had left him behind. He seemed restless, and even the sight of so many bones appeared to exercise no soothing effect upon him. At last, however, after repeated commands, he lay down, watchful but motionless, on the stone floor. I must have worked for several hours, and I was pausing to rest my eyes and hands, when I noticed for the first time the intense stillness that surrounded me. No sound from me reached the outer world. The church clock, which had clanged out so loud and ponderously as I went down the steps, had not since sent the faintest whisper of its iron down to me below. All was silent as a grave. This was the grave. Those who had come here had indeed gone down into silence. I repeated the words to myself, or rather, they repeated themselves to me. Gone down into silence. I was awakened from my reverie by a faint sound. I sat still and listened. Bats occasionally frequent vaults in underground places. The sound continued. Faint, stealthy, rather unpleasant sound. I do not know what kinds of sounds bats make, whether pleasant or otherwise. Suddenly there was a noise as of something falling, a momentary pause, and then an almost imperceptible but distant jangle as of a key. I had left the key in the lock after I had turned it, and I now regretted having done so. I got up, took one of the candles, and went back into the larger crypt, for though I trust I am not so effeminate as to be rendered nervous by hearing a noise for which I cannot instantly account, still, on occasion of this kind, I must honestly say, I should prefer that they did not occur. As I came towards the iron door, there was another distinct, I had almost said hurried sound. The impression on my mind was one of great haste. When I reached the door and held the candle near the lock to take out the key, I perceived that the other one, which hung by a short string to its fellow, was vibrating slightly. I should have preferred not to find it vibrating, as there seemed no occasion for such a course. But I put them both into my pocket and turned to go back to my work. As I turned, I saw on the ground what had occasioned the louder noise I had heard, namely a skull, which had evidently just slipped from its place on top of one of the walls of bones and had rolled almost to my feet. There, disclosing a few more inches of the top of an archway behind, was the place from which it had been dislodged. I stooped to pick it up, but fearing to display any more skulls by meddling with the pile, and not liking to gather up its scattered teeth, I let it lie, and went back to my work in which I was soon so completely absorbed, that I was only roused at last by my candles beginning to burn low and go out one after another. Then with a sigh of regret, for I had not nearly finished, I turned to go. Poor Brian, who had never quite reconciled himself to the place, was beside himself with delight. As I opened the iron door, he pushed past me, and a moment later I heard him whining and scratching, and, I had almost added, beating against the wooden one. I locked the iron door and hurried down the passage as quickly as I could, and almost before I got the other one ajar, there seemed to be a rush past me into the open air and Brian was bounding up the steps and out of sight. As I stopped to take out the key, I felt quite deserted and left behind. When I came out once more into the sunlight, there was a vague sensation all about me, in the air of exultant freedom. It was already late in the afternoon, and after I had sauntered back to the parsonage to give up the keys, I persuaded the people of the public house to let me join in the family meal, which was spread out in the kitchen. The inhabitants of wet waste were primitive people, with the frank, unabashed manner that flourishes still in lonely places, especially in the wilds of Yorkshire. But I had no idea that in these days of penny posts and cheap newspapers, such entire ignorance of the outer world could have existed in any corner, however remote, of Great Britain. When I took one of the neighbor's children on my knee, a pretty little girl with the palest aureole of flaxen hair I had ever seen, and began to draw pictures for her of birds and beasts of other countries, I was instantly surrounded by a crowd of children, and even grown-up people, 
while others came to their doorways and looked on from a distance, calling to each other in the strident unknown tongue which I have since discovered goes by the name Broad Yorkshire. The following morning, as I came out of my room, I perceived that something was amiss in the village. A buzz of voices reached me as I passed the bar, and in the next house I could hear through the open window a high-pitched wail of lamentation. The woman who brought me my breakfast was in tears, and in answer to my questions told me that the neighbor's child, the little girl whom I had taken on my knee the evening before, had died in the night. I felt sorry for the general grief that the little creature's death seemed to arouse, and the uncontrolled wailing of the poor mother took my appetite away. I hurried off early to my work, calling on my way for the keys, and with Brian for my companion descended once more into the crypt, and drew and measured with an absorption that gave me no time that day to listen for sounds real or fancied. Brian, too, on this occasion seemed quite content, and slept peacefully beside me on the stone floor. When I had worked as long as I could, I put away my books with regret that even then I had not quite finished, as I had hoped to do. It would be necessary to come again for a short time on the morrow. When I returned the keys late that afternoon, the old clergyman met me at the door and asked me to come in and have tea with him. "'And has the work prospered?' he asked, as we sat down in the long, low room into which I had just been ushered, and where he seemed to live entirely. I told him it had, and showed it to him. "'You have seen the original, of course,' I said. "'Once,' he replied, gazing fixedly at it. He evidently did not care to be communicative, so I turned the conversation to the age of the church. "'All here is old,' he said. "'When I was young, forty years ago, and came here because I had no means of mine own, and was much moved to marry at that time, I felt oppressed that all was so old, and that this place was so far removed from the world for which I had at times longing grievous to be born. But I had chosen my lot, and with it I was forced to be content. My son, marry not in youth for love, which truly in that season is a mighty power, turns away the heart from study, and young children break the back of ambition. Neither marry in middle life when woman is seen to be but a woman and her talk is weariness, so you will not be burdened with a wife in your old age. I had my own views on the subject of marriage, for I am of opinion that a well-chosen companion of domestic tastes and docile and devout temperament may be of material assistance to a professional man. But my opinions once formulated, it is not of moment to me to discuss them with others, so I changed the subject and asked if the neighbouring villages were as antiquated as wet waste. Yes, all about here is old, he repeated. The paved road leading to Dyke Fens is an ancient pack road, made even in the time of the Romans. Dyke Fens, which is very near here, a matter of but four or five miles, is likewise old and forgotten by the world. The Reformation never reached it. It stopped here. And at Dyke Fens they still have a priest and a bell and bow down before the saints. It is a damnable heresy, and weakly I expound it as such to my people, showing them true doctrines. And I have heard that this same priest has so far yielded himself to the evil one that he has preached against me as withholding gospel truth from my flock. But I take no heed of it, neither of his pamphlet touching the Clementine homilies, in which he vainly contradicts that which I have plainly set forth and proven beyond doubt concerning the world Asaf. The old man was fairly off on his favourite subject, and it was some time before I could get away. As it was, he followed me to the door, and I only escaped because the old clerk hobbled up at that moment and claimed his attention. The following morning I went for the keys for the third and last time. I had decided to leave early the next day. I was tired of wet waste, and a certain gloom seemed to my fancy to be gathering over the place. There was a sensation of trouble in the air, as if, although the day was bright and clear, a storm were coming. This morning, to my astonishment, the keys were refused to me when I asked for them. I did not, however, take the refusal as final. I make it a rule never to take a refusal as final, and after a short delay I was shown into the room where, as usual, the clergyman was sitting, or rather, on this occasion, was walking up and down. "'My son,' he said with vehemence, "'I know wherefore you have come, but it is of no avail. I cannot lend the keys again.' 
I replied that, on the contrary, I hoped he would give them to me at once. It is impossible, he repeated. I did wrong, exceeding wrong. I will never part with them again. Why not? He hesitated, and then said slowly, The old clerk, Abraham Kelly, died last night. He paused and then went on. The doctor has just been here to tell me of that which is a mystery to him. I do not wish the people of the place to know it, and only to me he has mentioned it, but he has discovered plainly on the throat of the old man, and also, but more faintly on the child's, marks as a strangulation. None but he has observed it, and he is at a loss how to account for it. I, alas, can account for it, but in one way. But in one way. I did not see what all this had to do with the crypt, but to humour the old man, I asked what that way was. It is a long story, and happily to a stranger it may appear but foolishness. But I will even tell it, for I perceive that unless I furnish a reason for withholding the keys, you will not cease to entreat me for them. I told you at first, when you inquired of me concerning the crypt, that it had been closed these thirty years, and so it was. Thirty years ago a certain Sir Roger de Spa departed this life. Even the lord of the manor of wet waste and dyke fence, the last of his family, which is now, thank the lord, extinct. He was a man of a vile life, neither fearing God nor regarding man, nor having compassion on innocence, and the lord appeared to have given him over to the tormentors even in this world, for he suffered many things of his vices, more especially from drunkenness, in which seasons, and they were many, he was as one possessed by seven devils, being an abomination to his household, and a root of bitterness to all, both high and low. And, at last, the cup of his iniquity being full to the brim, he came to die. And I went to exhort him on his deathbed, for I heard that terror had come upon him, and that evil imaginations encompassed him so thick on every side, that few of them that were with him could abide in his presence. But when I saw him, I perceived that there was no place of repentance left for him, and he scoffed at me and my superstition, even as he lay dying, and swore there was no God and no angel, and all were damned even as he was. And the next day, towards evening, the pains of death came upon him, and he raved the more exceedingly, inasmuch as he said he was being strangled by the evil one. Now on his table was his hunting knife, and with his last strength he crept and laid hold upon it, no man withstanding him, and swore a great oath that if he went down to burn in hell, he would leave one of his hands behind on earth, and that it would never rest until it had drawn blood from the throat of another and strangled him, even as he himself was being strangled. And he cut off his own right hand at the wrist, and no man dared go near him to stop him, and the blood went through the floor, even down to the ceiling of the room below, and thereupon he died. And they called me in the night, and told me of his oath, and I counselled that no man should speak of it, and I took the dead hand which none had ventured to touch, and I laid it beside him in his coffin, for I thought it better he should take it with him, so that he might have it, if haply some day after much tribulation he should perchance be moved to stretch forth his hand towards God. But the story got spread about, and the people were affrighted, so, when he came to be buried in the place of his father's, he being the last of his family, and the crypt likewise full, I had it closed, and kept the keys myself, and suffered no man to enter therein any more. For truly he was a man of an evil life, and the devil is not yet wholly overcome, nor cast chained into the lake of fire. So in time the story died out, for in thirty years much is forgotten. And when you came and asked me for the keys, I was at the first minded to withhold them. But I thought it was a vain superstition, and I perceive that you do but ask a second time for what is first refused. So I let you have them, seeing it was not an idle curiosity, but a desire to improve the talent committed to you that led you to require them. The old man stopped, and I remained silent, wondering what would be the best way to get them just once more. Surely, sir, I said at last, one so cultivated and deeply read as yourself cannot be biased by an idle superstition. I trust not, he replied, and yet it is a strange thing that since the crypt was opened, two people have died, and the mark is plain upon the throat of the old man and visible on the young child. 
No blood was drawn, but the second time the grip was stronger than the first. Third time, perchance. Superstition such as that, I said with authority, is an entire want of faith in God. You once said so yourself. I took a high moral tone, which is often efficacious with quit conscientious humble-minded people. He agreed, and accused himself of not having faith as a grain of mustard seed. But even when I had got him so far as that, I had a severe struggle for the case. It was only when I finally explained to him that if any malign influence had been let loose the first day, at any rate, it was out now for good or evil, and no further going or coming of mine could make any difference. That I finally gained my point. I was young, and he was old, and being much shaken by what had occurred, he gave way at last, and I wrested the case from him. I will not deny that I went down the steps that day with a vague, indefinable repugnance, which was only accentuated by the closing of the two doors behind me. I remember then, for the first time, the faint jangling of the key and other sounds which I had noticed the first day, and how one of the skulls had fallen. I went to the place where it still lay. I have already said these walls of skulls were built up so high as to be within a few inches of the top of the low archways that led into the more distant portions of the vault. The displacement of the skull in question had left a small hole just large enough for me to put my hand through. I noticed for the first time over the archway above it a carved coat of arms and the name, now almost obliterated, of Despar. This, no doubt, was the Despar vault. I could not resist moving a few more skulls and looking in, holding my candle as near the aperture as I could. The vault was full. Piled high, one upon another, were old coffins and remnants of coffins and strewn bones. I attribute my present determination to be cremated to the painful impression produced on me by the spectacle. The coffin nearest the archway alone was intact, save for a large crack across the lid. I could not get a ray from my candle to fall on the brass plates, but I felt no doubt this was the coffin of the wicked Sir Roger. I put back the skulls, including the one which had rolled down, and carefully finished my work. I was not there much more than an hour, but I was glad to get away. If I could have left wet waste at once, I should have done so, for I had a totally unreasonable longing to leave the place, but I found that only one train stopped during the day at the station from which I had come and that it would not be possible to be in time for it that day. Accordingly, I submitted to the inevitable, and wandered about with Brian for the remainder of the afternoon, and until late in the evening, sketching and smoking. The day was oppressively hot, and even after the sun had set across the burnt stretches of the walls, it seemed to grow very little cooler. Not a breath stirred. In the evening, when I was tired of loitering in the lanes, I went up to my own room, and after contemplating afresh my finished study at the fresco, I set to work to write the part of my paper bearing upon it. As a rule, I write with difficulty, but that evening words came to me with winged speed, and with them a hovering impression that I must make haste, that I was much pressed for time. I wrote and wrote until my candles guttered out and left me trying to finish by the moonlight, which, until I endeavoured to write by it, seemed as clear as day. I had to put away my M.S., and, feeling it was too early to go to bed, for the church clock was just counting out ten, I sat down by the open window and leaned out to try and catch a breath of air. It was a night of exceptional beauty, and as I looked out, my nervous haste and hurry of mind were allayed. The moon, a perfect circle, was, if so poetic an expression be permissible, as it were sailing across a calm sky. Every detail of the little village was as clearly illuminated by its beams as if it were broad day. So also was the adjacent church with its primeval hues, while even the worlds behind were dimly indicated, as if through tracing paper. I sat a long time leaning against the window sill. The heat was still intense. I am not, as a rule, easily elated or readily cast down. But as I sat that night in the lonely village on the moors, with Brian's head against my knee, how or why, I know not, a great depression gradually came upon me. My mind went back to the crypt and the countless dead who had been laid there. The sight of the gold to which all human life and strength and beauty travel in the end had not affected me at the time, but now the very air about me seemed heavy with death. 
What was the good, I asked myself, of working and toiling and grinding down my heart and youth in the mill of long and strenuous effort, seeing that in the grave folly and talent, idleness and labour lie together and are alike forgotten? Labour seemed to stretch before me till my heart ached to think of it, to stretch before me even to the end of life. And then came, at the recompense of my labour, the grave. Even if I succeeded, if, after wearing my life threadbare with toll, I succeeded, what remained to me in the end? A grave. A little sooner, while the hands and eyes were still strong to labour, or a little later, when all power and vision had been taken from them. Sooner or later, only, the grave. I do not apologize for the excessively morbid tenor of these reflections, as I hold that they were caused by the lunar effects which I have endeavoured to transcribe. The moon in its various quarterings has always exerted a marked influence on what I may call the subdominant, namely the poetic side of my nature. I roused myself at last, when the moon came to look in upon me where I sat, and leaving the window open, I pulled myself together and went to bed. I fell asleep almost immediately, but I do not fancy I could have been asleep very long when I was awakened by Brian. He was growling in a low muffled tone, as he sometimes did in his sleep when his nose was buried in his rug. I called out to him to shut up, and as he did not do so, turned in bed to find my matchbox or something to throw at him. The moonlight was still in the room, and as I looked at him, I saw him raise his head and evidently wake up. I admonished him and was just on the point of falling asleep when he began to growl again in a low, savage manner that waked me most effectually. Presently he shook himself and got up, and began prowling about the room. I sat in bed and called to him, but he paid no attention. Suddenly I saw him stop short in the moonlight. He showed his teeth and crouched down, his eyes following something in the air. I looked at him in horror. Was he going mad? His eyes were glaring, and his head moved slightly as if he were following the rapid movements of an enemy. Then, with a furious snarl, he suddenly sprang from the ground and rushed in great leaps across the room towards me, dashing himself against the furniture, his eyes rolling, snatching and tearing wildly in the air with his teeth. I saw he had gone mad. I leaped out of bed and, rushing at him, caught him by the throat. The moon had gone behind a cloud but in the darkness I felt him turn upon me, felt him rise up and his teeth close in my throat. I was being strangled. With all the strength of despair I kept my grip on his neck and, dragging him across the room, tried to crush in his head against the iron rail of my bedstead. It was my only chance. I felt the blood running down my neck. I was suffocating. After one moment of frightful struggle, I beat his head against the bar and heard his skull give way felt him give one strong shudder, a groan, and then I fainted away. When I came to myself, I was lying on the floor, surrounded by the people of the house, my reddened hand still clutching Brian's throat. Someone was holding a candle towards me, and the draught from the window made it flare and waver. I looked at Brian. He was stone dead. The blood from his battered head was trickling slowly over my hands. His great jaw was fixed in something that, in the uncertain light, I could not see. They turned the light a little. Oh, God, I shrieked. There, look, look. He's off his head, said someone, and I fainted again. I was ill for about a fortnight without regaining consciousness, a waste of time of which even now I cannot think without poignant regret. When I did recover consciousness, I found I was being carefully nursed by the old clergyman and the people of the house. I have often heard the unkindness of the world in general invade against, but for my part I can honestly say that I have received many more kindnesses than I have time to repay. Country people, especially, are remarkably attentive to strangers in illness. I could not rest until I had seen the doctor who attended me, and have received the assurance that I should be equal to reading my paper on the appointed day. The pressing anxiety removed, I told him of what I had seen before I fainted the second time. He listened attentively and then assured me in a manner that was intended to be soothing, that I suffered from an hallucination, due no doubt to the shock of my dog's sudden madness. Did you see the dog after it was dead? I asked. He said he did. The whole jaw was covered with blood and foam. The teeth certainly seemed convulsively fixed. 
but the case being evidently one of extraordinarily virulent hydrophobia, owing to the intense heat, he had had the body buried immediately. My companion stopped speaking as we reached our lodgings and went upstairs. Then, lighting a candle, he slowly turned down his collar. You see, I have the mark still, he said. But I have no fear of dying of hydrophobia. I am told such peculiar scars could not have been made by the teeth of a dog. If you look closely, you see the pressure of the five fingers. That is the reason why I wear high collars. End of Let Loose by Mary Chimondeli. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama.